have our speakers with us today. I am Njoki Njoki, and I'll be the session chair. Each talk will last up to 15 minutes with an additional of five minutes uh, and uh, for, talk, for questions, sorry, and, uh, to, and then we move to the next speaker. So during each talk, please go ahead and ask your questions via the Q&A tab. Q &A, Q &A tab. Um, our first speaker is Guang, who will speak to us about on the heaviness of package uh, dependencies. Please go ahead and share your screen. <clears throat> um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Zhu Guanggu, uh, and I work in a uh, German Cancer Research, Research Center uh, in Hedbeck, Germany. And today I'm going to uh, talk about uh, a package called PKG and DEP for analyzing the uh, dependency of our packages. So the dependence of our packages, and like um, our package, uh, uh, a package will use functionalities from other other packages, so that's where the dependency uh, comes. So, so basically, the dependency um, is normally listed in a package's uh, description file, like uh, like the one on, on the left. So, these dependency packages are normally listed in the imports field, the suggest field, a depends field, and sometimes enhances field. And also this, let's say these parent uh, packages, they also have their and um, their dependencies. So this construct, this forms a dependency uh, network or graph. So on the right, for example, a package, a package P, these blue uh, packages are all like, they are like a parent packages of P or they are upstream packages of P. So these blue packages are dependency packages of, for the package B, uh, for package P. So when uh, the package P has a large dependency, so it's it's quite expected that um, it will be li very likely that uh, it produces um, difficulties for installing P because um, as long as any one of the upstream dependency packages um, filled with the installation, then your the package P cannot be installed. And also even the package P can be successfully, uh, as well as these uh, dependent packages are successfully installed, when you do library p and when you do when you and um, run session info function you will see a lot of packages are loaded in your session and which makes it very difficult to like to produce um, exactly the same working environment like for this reproducible uh, research and also if there's a package um depend uh, depends on p so if a package is a child package or package p then all the dependence of p where goes to its child packages and the last one is uh, related to the first one. So if you use uh, GitHub Action for automatically validation your package, it also very likely to fail because the failure of the um, upstream packages. There are also there are some uh, repositories. They also report the uh, the number of dependencies. For example, on Biconductor, you will see how many uh, uh, how many. Uh, dependency packages a package ha has. And also in the R, uni uh, the R universe, mm, they also report the number of uh, dependencies for a package. So to get this number, the number of dependency for a package, simply run uh, this uh, package dependency functions, then you will have the number of dependency packages for a specified uh, uh, package. So now a package may have um, several uh, parent packages. So some parent packages, they just bring very small amount of dependency packages, and some parent packages may bring a lot of additional uh, dependent packages. Now we want to ask the question, uh, which parent packages contributes high dependency to the package P, or what are the heaviest parent, parent packages or package, package P? So to answer these questions, uh, we designed a new metric called dependency heaviness to quantitatively measure the, let's say, how heavy a parent package is. So before we go to the definition, we uh, simply uh, uh, simply describe the, the, the different dependency categories of P. So the strong parent pa uh, packages category, it's the packages listed in the depends, imports, and linking to um, of package P. 
and this is also category uh, weak parent packages. These are the parent packages list in suggest and enhances field uh, or package P. And there's another one called strong dependent packages. They are, they are all the uh, uh, upstream uh, packages which have the strong dependency relations to the package. So basically, if you want to install package P, then you need then you need to install all these strong dependent packages before installing your package P. So now we have these different categories. So I will first introduce the definition of happiness of a strong parent and denoted as A on package P. So let's say N1 is the number of strong dependencies of P and N2 is also the number of strong dependencies of P, but now we change A from a strong parent to a weak parent. So you can see in these following two figures. So originally A is, um, is a strong parent of package B and to calculate N2, now we move A as a weak parent or, parent or, or package P to calculate N2, then the heaviness of A on P is the difference of these two numbers. So if from the aspect of the dependency network, so this, these are the networks which only contain the strong dependency relations. So N1, so this is the package P, the green node, the N1 is the number of the upstream, mode, the upstream nodes of P, the number of blue uh, nodes. So now because A is a strong parent of P to calculate the heaviness, now we, we move, we change uh, A from a strong parent to a weak parent, which means we remove the relation of uh, between A and P. So we remove this, uh, this branch. Now the N2 is the number of the strong dependencies after removing an A uh, from this uh, dependency network, network. So in this example, N1 is nine, there's nine um, upstream packages and N2 is only six. So there's only six uh, uh, strong uh, upstream packages. So the heaviness is the difference uh, between nine and six, which is three. So basically the heaviness measures the number of additionally unique dependencies that A uh, brings to, uh, to P that are not um, brought by any other parent packages. So if, if uh, for the weak parents, let's say P, uh, B on the package P, so N1 is still the number of strong dependencies of P to calculate N2, so now we move B from a weak parent to a strong parent. It's still the number of strong dependencies. So for example, for example, move, moving B to imports OP. So initially the B is a weak uh, parent OP. It's, it's in the suggest field and now move to, and the, uh, this, as a strong parent move to the imports field. So the heaviness of B on P is still the difference of these two uh, numbers. So again, from the aspect of the dependency network, so initially, because P is a weak parent of P, so the B is not connected to P. So uh, the heaviness, now we, we change B as a strong parent. So basically we um, add a new link from B to P. So this is N1 equals to six, and on the right N1, uh, N2 equals to nine, and the heaviness is the difference of these two numbers, which is three. So it's still, I mean, for a weak parent, the heaviness also measures the number of uh, additional unique uh, dependence packages that B uh, brings to P. So the uh, the packet, the PKG and that package also provides a, a visualization for visualizing the dependencies with the heat map. Uh, so this is an example of the dependence for um, a package called complex heat map. So um, the rows, so the rows corresponds to uh, complex heat maps. Uh, direct um, parents package, uh, pa direct, uh, direct parents packages, which are these packages, and the columns are the let's say upstream uh, packages that these uh, parent packages uh, bring in. So the rows are split by the three categories that depend the package, the parent package, uh, which are, uh, has a depends relation to this complex schema package that imports and suggests, and so basically these two, the first two are the strong, uh, they have the, they contain the strong dependencies and the, the, the suggest contains the weak, uh, the weak uh, uh, dependency relations. On the right side, there are three, uh, uh, three annotations. The first one is the, the number of imported functions or the number of imported 
S4 classes or S4 methods. And the other two uh, bar plot annotation is the number of the uh, dependent dependencies that every parent uh, brings in or the number of uh, dependence, dependencies that every parent uniquely brings in. So basically the last one is the heaviness of the parent uh, packages. So to use this package, it's very simple. You basically use this pkgnd function. You can just specify the name of the package or the path, the local path or the, the URL of the package. Then if you, then you run a um, plot function, it produces this uh, dependency heat map. So now we can do some uh, dependency heaviness analysis. So the basic, uh, the basic uh, aim is to detect those uh, very heavy strong parents uh, packages and to to move them as a weak uh, um, parents, if possible. So next, I will show three examples. The first example is the map stat package. So this package has a very small number of parent uh, packages, like there are only uh, nine pa uh, parent, strong parent packages. These are all the uh, strong parent packages. But we can see there is one uh, parent package, HMISC, which brings a lot of additional uh, dependent packages. So in total, there are 83 packages, but HMISC has this HMISC package has, has the heaviness of 49, which means uh, the HMISC uh, package uniquely brings in 49 additional dependency packages. So if you check, if you go to the source code or map stats package and to check how it uses HMISC package, we can see in the namespace file, it only uses one function, it only imports one function from HMISC package, which is capital capitalized and it was only used in one line of map step package and and if we check this uh, this uh, capitalized uh, function it's very it's a very simple function it just capitalized the first letter of uh, in a sentence so basically that means the developer can simply re-implement re a capitalized function then this 49 additional dependency can be uh, get rid of so the second uh, example is a complex heat map package. So, so this is a dependency uh, heat map of this package. We can see the strong uh, dependency, uh, the, the number are very, uh, or the size is very small and all these heavy parents are in the suggest, the suggest uh, field of complex heat map package. So the complex heat map package makes a heat map. So it's core functionality is to make heat map and there, it also has some enhanced uh, functionality, which like which is like, so when you draw this dendrogram um, on the on the two sides of the heat map, sometimes you can color the dendrogram like different branches with different colors. Then you can use some like enhanced uh, additional packages. For example, the dent extend packages, and um, which can be used to uh, color the uh, color the, uh, the, the dendrogram branch. And also, we can use the gray text package to to customize the labels in the heat map. But these two packages, you can see the, the heaviness of a band extend package is 32, means it will bring 32 additional dependency packages to complex heat map. And the gray text will bring 14 additional uh, dependency packages to complex heat map. So because these two example packages, they only provide enhanced functionalities for functions for a complex heat map. And I think maybe less than 1% of the user will use this uh, these uh, these functionalities. So, because I'm also the developer of complex schema package, so I move these two packages to the suggests of complex schema. So, just to make them to 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 list them to to mark them as uh, to categorize categorize them as weak parents of complex schema. So now the complex schema only has thirty uh, strong um, dependencies. Why, if include all these parents um, as and strong parents, there will be 122 um, in total dependency packages will be uh, installed or required. So the third example is the color package, which is also developed by me. So this is a typical example for these uh, bioinformatics and R packages. Like they have a core uh, analysis. They also have they, they also have this downstream analysis. So this is the dependency heat map for the color package. So the first category in the heat map is um, is the strong dependencies, and the, the next, the second one is a weak uh, dependencies. Dependencies. So you can see, and so the color has a very small size of strong dependencies. All the heavy uh, packages are 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 in the 
a weak parents categories. So the Coca-Cola packages uh, performs a uh, consensus clustering uh, for biologic data mat matrices. So it also provides some downstream analysis. So basically, Cola performs is constant clustering on, for example, the gene expression matrix to predict the, the subgroups of patients or the samples. So this is a core analysis of Cola package. So in a bioinformatic analysis, when, you, when we have the uh, subgroups, then the next analysis to look for the, the genes which uh, show significant difference between subgroups and then to, to, to check the biological functions of the signature genes, which, which will uh, involve the functional enrichment analysis and there are some packages for the functional enrichment analysis, but there are many of these functional enrichment analysis packages are very heavy. For example, the cluster profiler package, which is very popular for the functional enrichment analysis, but it has a heaviness of 91. So, which means if Cola um, adds cluster profiler as a strong uh, parent, then 91 additional dependency packages will be required. There are also some other ways to reduce the dependency complexity. So if, if a package um, relies a function from another heavy uh, parent package, I mean, you can also, you can, you can just copy the code from that heavy parent uh, package. Of course, this method is not uh, recommended to use, but according to this study, it's very commonly used in a lot of CRAN uh, packages. And the second is to separate a large package into, into several smaller packages where each package focuses on a specific um, analysis task. And to reduce the dependency from weak parents, so the weak parents are those packages in the suggests or enhance, uh, suggest field they normally use in uh, examples or in a vignette. So, so, so if, 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 if the parent package, is, the weak parent package is really heavy, so you can, I mean, you can provide the code in the example or in the vignette, but do not run them. So this, and, and put this weak parent to the enhances field. So this weak parent will, parent package will not be installed by R. And also if, if like, for example, if you do bioinformatics analysis and you have very complex uh, vignette with very complex uh, examples, so you can, you can serve this uh, complex vignette um, somewhere else, like independently, but not, uh, not uh, ship them with the package. So there are some future plans for this uh, PKG and that package because now we have this uh, measurement and we are planning to perform a systematic analysis on all the packages on Serene by conductor to eco package ecosystem to to check uh, one how this dependency uh, spreads from parents to child packages this uh, uh, short range or direct. Um, relation, and we also plan to check and how the this dependent having is spread from low range, like from the very upstream to the downstream, and we want we, we are planning to to check to uh, to study the the core path in the dependence network that spreads the 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 dependent the, the, the heaviness. and so it's partially actually it's partially done with this function dependency website, but it's not completely done. So this function is not uh, public, but I can show you some uh, example of this uh, this uh, database or this website. So there will be a table which lists all the packages on Serena and Bioconductor. You can see the and this corresponding statistics is heaviness from the parent heaviness to the child heaviness to the downstream, and there's also a report, but this report is not has not been finished yet. This is like a global uh, dependency heaviness analysis on all packages. And then when you click uh, one package, then you can see this uh, report for single package. You can see this uh, uh, statistics, the, the dependency heat map, and the, this table for the parent packages for the upstream packages. And you can see this there are some uh, dependency, uh, dependency network from the upstream to this package. And you, we can also see the, 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 the report for the child packages and for the downstream packages. You can also see the network for the, 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 downstream, uh, the downstream packages. And basically that's everything about this PKG and DEP uh, package. And I also have a, a, a preprint pre 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 for a paper uh, for this package is on bioarchive. And if you are interested, you can go there and 
and, and check, have a check. Thank you. And now I'm ready for your uh, questions. Thank you, Guang. That was an insightful uh, talk. I learned a lot that I didn't know. So we have two questions for you, but I'll ask one and then please go ahead and answer the, question, the other one on chat. So by Jeremy, uh, for the dependency heat map, is it possible for the plot um, it in a, to plot it, sorry, in a vertical format rather than a horizontal format. It can be quite hard to see if the number of packages goes up to a few hundreds. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, I think so because this heat map is made by this uh, this uh, complex heat map package, and this uh, uh, complex heat map package provides a very flexible way to to handle. It's possible. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we'll move to our next speaker, who is um, Lorenz. So Lorenz will speak to us about uh, beta commits with the pre-commit package. Please go ahead and share your screen. And uh, to our participants, uh, please ask, ask your questions on the Q&A uh, tab. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. Yeah, uh, welcoming, welcome to my talk on pre-commit for R. I'm excited to share with you how pre-commit can help you save time and write better code. So let's start with the problem definition. Developers spend a lot of time fixing trivial problems. These can often be detected and fixed by existing tools like code formatters, linters, and so on. On this slide, I've collected a few of those that I find personally quite annoying. The longer the feedback loop, the more annoying these mistakes are. For example, if you push a pull request to GitHub and then you see five minutes later that RCMD check fails because the docs are outdated, that is really a bit annoying. So there are different ways how you can deal with these like trivial small mistakes. A naive way is to always remember to do things well. I can only speak for myself, but I make a lot of those mistakes. So that's not really an option for me. What most people then do is that they use continuous integration so they can notice problems, for example, before they merge a pull request. But that still takes time. So in my opinion, the solution is to spot the problems before they enter version control. And that is exactly what pre-commit is all about. So you may wonder what pre-commit is exactly. Pre-commit is a framework to manage Git hooks and Git hooks are unit tests for your commits. And those are invoked via Git commit. And you see an example here at the top. So I'm running Git commit on the command line and there is one hook, the hook is called style files and it passes and then the commit is made. The commit is not made if either the hook finds a problem or the hook changes a file. In that case, the commit is aborted. Pre-commit is written in Python and has a command line interface, but it supports many other languages than Python, for example, R. There's also an R package called pre-commit, which I wrote, that implements the R specific components. And it has two goals. First, it provides use this like functionality to set up pre-commit for a project and interface with the pre-commit instead of using the CLI. So you can use the R console for most functionality. The second goal is that the package implements hooks that are useful if your repository contains R code. So what can pre-commit do for you? It can help you save time by letting you fix problems before they go into version control or sometimes even fixes the problem for you. And it can help you to write better commits, which ultimately will give a better code quality. So enough to, for the theory for now, I would love to show you pre-commit in action. And for that, we're having a RStudio Cloud um, instance here. You can also use pre-commit on your local RStudio and also outside of RStudio, so it's uh, editor agnostic. The first step 
that we have to do is we have to install pre-commit, which as I said, is a Python package. So we can install it using pip. Second step is that we have to install the R package pre-commit, which um, will allow you to use um, the helper functions from within R. This doesn't install any hooks yet. So now we're good to go and we have to add pre-commit support for this specific uh, repository here. You can see on the right that it has a very minimal structure and is a Git repository. So I'm going to use the respective function from the pre-commit package to set up pre-commit for this specific repository. I'm also going to deactivate the continuous integration part so we can focus on what happens locally. Sorry, Lawrence, is it possible for you to zoom in? Um, participants are struggling to see, so it's myself. OK, yeah. Um, I'll try to do that. Is that better? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so a few things happened here. Um, most importantly, you can see that there was a file added, a pre-commit config file that basically defines which hooks we want to run. And as you can see from the file structure, the hooks can come from different repositories. So the top repository is the repository that I authored, where the R hooks are, but there's also other hooks that I'm using in that config file. And that's just the template that we're using. You can edit this file, and you can add and remove repositories or hooks. Each repository has a version associated with it. So everyone who uses this, these hooks from that repository has the same code that they run. And then the hooks from the repository are listed like this. For example, the style file hooks uh, hook formats your code according to the tidyverse style guide using the styler package. There's also additional configuration that you can pass um, to each and every hook. As you can see, there are other hooks. For example, there's a hook um, that lets you generate documentation that has a smart caching built in. There's a hook that checks the spelling and so on. So for this demo, I'm actually going to focus on two hooks. So I'm going to remove everything except for two hooks. So it's maybe a bit easier to understand and follow. We're going to use the parsable R hook, which is basically checking if the code that you wrote can be parsed by R, which is something that you almost always want to hold true. And we're going to use uh, the style files hook that formats the, your code according to the tidyverse style guide. So next, I'm going to commit this file. And you can use um, the RStudio Git tab, or you can also use the command line. And you can already see here that these two hooks were um, listed, but they were both skipped because we committed a YAML file. And those two hooks, they only deal with R files. So now that we're all set, let's see the hooks in action. I'm first going to focus on the parsable R hook, which is a read-only hook. So I'm going to comment out the other hook, which is basically this equivalent to deactivating the style files hook. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a file that can't be parsed by R, and we will see what happens. So as you can see, this file cannot be parsed by R because there's a missing quote at the end. It could also be a missing comma or a missing brace. And obviously, here you can spot the problem easily. But if your file is big, then it can easily happen that you miss one of those and your file isn't parsable. So let's see what happens when we commit these changes. So you can see, see now the display is a bit, uh, oh, no, no, it's better. You can see that the hook fails and it points us to the file that is the problem. In that case, it's this file. 
because it's not parsable. And basically what we have to do next is we have to fix the problem ourselves. So we're gonna add the missing quote here. We're gonna add the changes to the index and we're gonna try again using git commit. And you can see this time the hook passed and the commit was made, which is basically what we wanted. Now let's have a look at the second hook, which is not a read-only hook like parsable R, but it's actually gonna format code if it isn't compliant already. I'm just commenting out the parsable R hook for now, so we can focus on the other hook. And I'm going to write code that isn't compliant with the tidyverse style guide. Namely, here you can see there are missing spaces around the assignment of uh, the equal equality comparison operator. So same, same thing here. Let's add those changes to the git index and let's attempt to commit. This time as well, you can see that um, the git commit doesn't go through because the style files hook failed. And in that case, it was because it has modified the file. You can already see it here on the right in the git um, tab that there are unstash, uh, unstaged changes. So if you go ahead and have a look, you can see that Styler has actually added spaces around here. So the file is already fixed. All we need to do is to add the change to the index again and then commit again. And the hook has passed. So these are the two types of hook, read-only hook and hooks that write back to the files. So now you might say that's all pretty nice, but what happens if my collaborators aren't using pre-commit and they might actually push code that doesn't comply to the hooks to GitHub and we don't notice. And that's exactly when the cloud integration comes into, into play. You can use GitHub Actions or pre-commit CI to enforce passing hooks on pull requests for free. And that you can do using the pre-commit UCI function. But I'm not going to do that now because I've already set it up um, pre-commit CI for this specific repository. This would require you to authentic authenticate with uh, GitHub before you can proceed. So a usual scenario is that a collaborator of you would maybe work on a different branch and then create a pull request. So let's do that. First, I'm gonna, pick, gonna push all the changes that we've made to the main branch. Now I'm gonna create a new branch where I will create a pull request from. Go back to our file here and edit some more code that isn't compliant to the tidyverse style guide. Again, we can commit that. And now we wanna skip the hooks. And there are different ways in pre-commit how you can do that. But for now, I'm just gonna use an option to skip all the hooks which is uh, the no verify flag on the Git terminal. So this skips all the hooks. And you can see that's git commit without the hooks. And I can push these changes to GitHub after setting the upstream. Now I can go ahead and have a look. Yeah, I can go ahead and create a pull request from the feature branch onto the main branch. And now we see here the pre-commit CI integration showing up. So now what happens is that the pre-commit hooks are run in the cloud and it's pretty fast. As you can see, it already failed. So we can go here and have a look what is the problem. And you can see, of course, the problem was that there was a lacking space um, around the equality comparison operator. And what's nice about pre-commit CI is that it basically automatically tries to fix the problems and push the changes to GitHub. So this is the commit where pre-commit uh, CI tries to fix your commit. And you can see now all good, everything passed. We are ready to merge this pull request.
So that's it for the demo. Um, let me, as, as a last point, let me quickly talk about why I think pre-commit is standing out compared to other tools for code quality improvement. First, it allows you to focus on your code because the hooks are maintained, tested, and documented outside of your repository. And all you need is a pre-commit config file, as you've seen before. You can use pre-commit locally, remotely, or both. That makes it easy to debug and makes it uh, creates a short loop compared to GitHub Actions, for example. Pre-commit offers dependency isolation. So anyone who uses the hooks uses the same version of the underlying tools, produces the same result, and your global R library isn't touched. For example, if people use different styler versions, they will get different formatting. But if you use pre-commit, the version is fixed and everyone uses the same release. In addition, pre-commit prevents Git history convolution because it detects problems before they enter version control. And so you won't need dozens of oops command, uh, commits in your history. We also leverage the power of the crowd. There are hundreds, if not thousands of, hook, thousands of hooks that other people have already created in Bash, R, Python, and other programming languages that you can easily use. Just add them to your pre-commit config file. Pre-commit is also extendable. You can write your own R code and run it as a hook, which is very easy. Finally, pre-commit is independent. It's an open source project, and there is no lock-in with GitHub or any other organization. Yeah, that was it. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope now you know what pre-commit is and how it can boost your code quality. If your company or you find my work on pre-commit or style are useful, you can su support me on GitHub sponsors. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you, Lorenz, for that insightful talk as well. We have a couple of questions, but I will start with one question, then please go ahead to the chats and answer the remaining questions. So Nasinski is asking, why not simply use Brew or Apps uh, pre-commit? Um, Excuse me, can you repeat the question? Uh, why not use Brew or Apps pre-commit um, and follow up? Um, I have a bad experience with spelling and automatic append of word list in standard pre-commits. Oh, we have to be careful. Um, so the question is, why not simply use Brew or apps pre-commit? To install it? Yeah, you can also use that. I was just using pip because it's a Python framework, but on the on the page, on the homepage of the pre-commit framework, you can see the different uh, supported installation methods and Brew is also among them. You can um, you can also use uh, the, the um, um, from RStudio, you can also install everything um, using Miniconda, but then the executable isn't so easily accessible. So I think Brew is a good option if you're on Mac OS. Okay, thank you so much. And I uh, will move to our third um, speaker who is done. will speak to us about authenticating our package distribution. Uh, Dan, please go ahead and share your screen. Lawrence, can you stop the screen sharing? Thank you. Um, hello everyone, my name is Dan Seinav. I'm a consultant and software engineer for Open Analytics. And today I want to speak about how to go about um, implementing authentication for private CRAN-like repositories. So to unpack that a bit, um, what I mean with distribution in this talk, I mainly want to focus on the end user installation from a repository server. Um, with a CRAN-like repository server, I mean a repository server that serves packages in the same structure as um, CRAN does or CRAN. Um, and so that is understood by all the tooling in the, in the base R packages. Um, 
why would you want to authenticate uh, private repositories? Uh, usually because if you're dealing with yeah, confidential code or confidential data, um, your packages may contain confidential content or sometimes even the name of the package uh, may be confidential in itself. The projects that I've been a part of, I've usually seen this solved in two ways. Um, one is when typically appears when IT uh, gets involved and typically they will solve things by setting up an isolated network zone like a VPN and solve the authentication problem on the network level. So you first have to authenticate to the VPN and after that uh, you have access to the private repository. The downside of that approach is that you have no granular access control over who can access what package or who can access what repository. Um, the other type of approach I've seen used is to use an alternative means of package distribution. Um, yeah, packages like remotes, for example, support installing uh, packages directly from GitHub. So then if you're dealing with a private GitHub organization, you could use a personal access token and so on. The downside of that approach is that it uh, doesn't work out of the box with base R tooling. Now, initially when I started working on this project, my initial idea was to use OO2 because it's an industry standard for um, implementing authentication. Uh, however, it should be noted that OO2 is actually not an authentication protocol. It's uh, what's called a delegation protocol but we can use OAuth 2 to build uh, an authentication protocol on top. And that's exactly what OpenID Connect is supposed to do. So it adds a thin authentication layer on top of the primitives that OAuth 2 presents us. And the most standard authentication flow within OpenID Connect is this so-called authorization code flow. So this is a redirect based flow that basically has as a purpose if somebody tries to connect to um, a protected resource, for example, in this case, a repository server, we are redirected to a different website where we have to fill in credentials, then we receive an access token, and then we can use that access token against the original uh, repository server to gain access to our private packages. Of course, um, following such a redirect based flow requires that the user has access to um, a web browser. Uh, and that is only one way as our users that we typically want to access packages. Another popular way that we, uh, or the other main way that we want to access packages, of course, by directly using R itself. Um, and while, yeah, potentially it, is technically feasible to fully participate in a redirect based workflow from R. The uh, implementation would be very difficult and we would have to deal with uh, user credentials, which one of the main uh, benefits of uh, OO2 and OpenID Connect is that it gives us a way to authenticate users without uh, gaining knowledge of their credentials. Uh, so at this point, I was stuck and I involved uh, another colleague into the project, um, who is Tobia de Koning, and he suggested to use uh, this other extension of OO2 that's called the device code flow. And originally, this is a flow that was made for authenticating um, smart devices like uh, televisions. If you've ever had to authenticate by scanning a QR code on your smart TV, that's probably the O2 flow that was used here. But um, another use case and one that has been explored in, uh, in different language communities and R is to um, use, to also use this flow for command line utilities. Um, so how does that look like in a picture? So instead of directly using a browser, now a user has two devices. One is his R console, and the second one is his browser. The idea is that when we start the authentication, our 
R will contact the authorization server and will request a device code. And then it will start polling the authorization server to continuously ask, has the user been authenticated? Has he been authenticated? And so on. Um, in the meantime, the user is presented with a verification URL and a user code, which he can then open on his browser. There he completes the authentication or the login. And then finally, that R process that was continuously polling will finally get a successful result. Um, We'll, we'll be able to exchange the device code for an access token. And then this access token can be used with the repository server as before. Um, so in terms of requirements to actually implement this in R, what we need is first of all, an R client that ideally should be as user-friendly as possible and hide away as much as possible the complexity of the diagram I just showed. Um, it should ideally integrate well with base R tooling. Second, we need a repository server that actually hosts our private packages. And lastly, we need um, an authorization server that is actually responsible for authenticating the user. So this last one is fairly trivial because there are a number of uh, general purpose um, authorization servers on the, even open source on the on the market examples are like keycloak or dex um, so my main focus is on those first two and while it's yeah technically possible to implement everything in R yourself and yeah, a properly configured web server can also uh, yeah uh, implement this uh, oo 2 access token um, we essentially wanted something that works out of the box. And so we uh, yeah, started a project with, that has the name Crane. Uh, why Crane? Um, mostly because it has uh, CRAN in it, in the word, but also it's a, it's a very cool bird that, um, fun fact, it's a anonymatopoeia. So the, the name of the bird is based on the sound it makes, which I find funny. and. Um, since it was matching as a name, that's what we went with. So what is Crane? Well, it's exactly what I described before. It's the combination of an R client and a repository server. The R client is yeah, uh, a normal R package and the repository server is a Spring Boot application. And I should also mention that um, we have uh, an open source solution for package management, which is the part I said I wouldn't talk about at the beginning of the talk, but um, all this integrates nicely with that. Um, but for the rest, I'll leave that out of scope. So how do you use it? Um, from R, there are basically two steps. One is you have to tell Crane about um, which uh, repo is uh, an authenticated one, and that's by using this register function, the client ID, the device code URL and the token URL you can typically obtain from the authorization server and they are okay to be public knowledge at least in the device code flow, it doesn't uh, hold for every flow. Um, the second step uh, is to enable the, um, some hooks that will integrate with the base R tooling by installing a shim or a hook over the, the download file function in utils. And then after that, basically you can use install packages as you would have done with a publicly available um, repository. The nice thing is also that you can perfectly mix and match um, repositories that are private and public because the shim will make sure to only uh, um, append the access token to the requests that go to the intended server. So in this case, we are installing from my private uh, repository and from uh, CRAN. And in this case, yeah, I don't want CRAN to receive my, uh, my access token because they could use it to replay. Um, and uh, for the server configuration, 
that is basically a YAML file that you can use to identify who should have access to what repository. So in this case, there are three repositories, a bio one that has a complex access control procedure. There is a chem one that's fully public. Uh, and then there is an internal that basically allows access to everyone that's uh, logged in. Then I'll show a quick demo. Um, the demo consists of an authorization server, which is Keycloak in this case. Um, the repository content is managed by our depot in the background. We have the Crane server that's serving a single package. Um, I've used the, one of our internal styling packages, which is called OA style. And the demo also involves the Crane um, R client package. So um, you see that if you install without having any authentication access uh, active, this will result in an error. But then once we enable the hooks and once we uh, register the repository, then if I try again to install the same package, then you will see um, this uh, prompt for the user to open the verification URL in his browser. Uh, so on the left side, there is the browser. The user is logging in, uh, allows our access to use his identity. And then finally, the install a command functions as expected. If you want to try it out for yourself, we've set up a documentation website um, at crane.rdepot.io. It can, contains both uh, documentation for using the R client and setting up the server. And yeah, at the bottom, you also all the source code is also on GitHub. So if you want to have a look at that, uh, feel free. Um, the two components, the client and the crane server are um, completely usable independently. If you already have a package server that is able to protect itself with O2, you should be able to use this um, Crane R package out of the box. Uh, in terms of future directions, things I still want to have a look at is to eliminate this uh, manual registration step. Um, and we are also interested in adding more functionality to the repository server to give it index pages and maybe even a user-friendly browser view. And we also want to look into uh, allowing to use our depot itself as a authorization server uh, so that you don't need to set up an extra OAuth2 um, authorization server if you don't have one. So that's it if there are questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Okay, thank you, Dan. Uh, at the moment, we don't have any question, but for the sake of time, you may stop sharing the screen and um, we'll have Julian uh, speak to us. Hi, let me share my screen very quick. All right. I hope you can see this okay. My name is Julia Menes, and I wanted to give you an update on behalf of the R Validation Hub. So without further ado, um, for those who have not heard about the R Validation Hub yet, um, this whole project got started in 2018, and we were wondering if it is possible um, to integrate R into Pharma. Um, it might be a, a weird thing to ask, but Pharma has like a long history of licensed proprietary tools uh, for statistical analysis and um, the regulatory environment and requires the insurance of reproducibility of the analysis software. Not only you have to ensure it, also you need a proof to that you have um, looked into reliability, reproducibility, and the documentation of measures that you have taken 
to mitigate risks and the just risk and justifying the use of that particular software that you're using. So just to mention two guidelines, one is the good clinical practice guideline by the ICH and the other one, uh, other guideline is by the Food and Drug Administration, which would specify and put quote unquote validation as establishing documented evidence with, which provides a high degree of assurance that a specific process consistently produces a product meeting its predetermined specification and quality attributes. So the main challenge of using our late phase trials, clinical trials, is ensuring that validation documentation. So the Our Validation Hub has started out in uh, 2018 as a, a PSI and special interest group. And within PSI, um, PSI is supporting the validation hub um, as one of its special interest group stated objectives, along with bridging the gap to SAS and educating members of R more broadly. In June 2018, the R Consortium also awarded funding to create an online repository of R validation in accordance to that regulatory standard. We have members from approximately 60 companies and we attempt to have regular meetings that um, end up being aimed to be quarterly updates. And, uh, but recently we had like a little um, more frequent meetings actually. So uh, we established a mission back then, um, which is the R Validation Hub is a cross industry initiative whose mission is to enable the use of R by the biopharmaceutical industry in regulatory setting, where the out output may be used for submission in regulatory agency agencies. Having said that, um, since we have started, there are a bunch of resources, it's a collection of resources that was actually created. Um, most of those resources can be found on our webpage pharma.org. And um, most importantly, there is, was a, a white paper written back then that was outlining a framework for risk-based approach to assess our package accuracy within the validated infrastructure that we have in Pharma. Uh, we also have a collection of various blog posts and conference presentations that go into different aspects of, um, of um, yeah, <laughs> of the white paper, essentially. And most recently, we have conducted a three-part uh, series of case studies where a number of pharma companies have presented their implementation, their practical implementation of the framework. Um, they are also um, under the umbrella of the uh, our validation hub, there were also some tools developed, such as the R package risk metric, which provides a number of metrics to help to qualify uh, quantify the package quality. And that is, uh, was led by Doug, but recently was handed over to uh, Eric Milliman. And a shiny application for that risk me uh, metric paid package is also available, and that effort is led by Mali Gotti. To review those resources a little bit more detail, let's start with the white paper. Um, it suggests a pipeline for risk-based assessment of contributed R packages. As for core packages, means base and recommended packages, the R Foundation has provided a guidance to document um, the regulatory compliance and also validation issues. Um, based on that, it can be concluded that there is a minimal risk in using core R in regulatory analysis and reporting. So that's good news. For contributed R packages, um, it's a little bit more complicated. There's a large variation of quality, robustness, and trustworthiness from a pharma perspective, obviously. Um, Tran passes a series of technical checks, but it is not necessarily guaranteed that the package is accurate in terms of it is actually doing what it's supposed to do. So the validation hub in this white paper has outlined a framework that is assessing that accuracy of our packages and documents that respective process. It recommends, for instance, to focus on components of the systems that actually will be used, so the intended to use package, 
um, different standards for packages which implement statistic methods or algorithms in, in contrast to packages which are doing um, simply data manipulation and visualization. Uh, it also recommends to consider maintenance of good practice, means software development cycles if applicable, but also community use and testing coverage. And if a certain standard is not used, there's basically a whole other process that can uh, be kicked off, which is uh, the whole re remediation and testing. So um, if certain standards are not met, there's always the, uh, the improvement of testing that can help out. So that was the theory of the, as I put that in quotes, the theory. Um, but there are also tools. Um, so risk, the risk metric package really supports the risk-based validation of our packages. It's a um, package that collects the package information from a variety, variety of sources, such as public package and uh, public source code repos, also a local source code and locally installed package libraries. So with the first package ref, um, it builds a collection of package metadata, which then may be helpful for the risk assessment. In a second step, that uh, metadata will be used to this package assess to derive, derive a number of metrics from this metadata. And then the third step, we have a package score which consolidates those metrics into numeric indications of the quality of the package. And then finally, we summarize the, uh, the package uh, scores uh, to one um, aggregated risk score. Here we have an example for six different packages of different popularity. You may know these or may not know these. That's the whole point of having that uh, broadband and um, a, an example output for such a um, for such an analysis that can be easily run. In addition, under the umbrella of the R validation app, there's also a risk assessment app, which is an extension of the risk metric package. And uh, that provides that graphical interface to the risk metric functionality, but also improves the ease to use for non-technical users. So um, inheriting the advantage from Shiny. Um, the user does not need any uh, prior R programming knowledge to use this application. And, um, but at the same time, they can, they can uh, provide feedback and, uh, on the risk calculated in the package. So on the left, you see that the package is selected, deployed with a specific version. It is uh, in a review. And then on the right, you have um, the different metrics, uh, maintenance metrics that have been derived. So there are other tabs here for community metrics. And uh, uh, based on that, uh, you can gather information on, uh, on that uh, metrics, but you can also directly comment and uh, motivate non-technical users to comment on their assessment. All these uh, things are then, uh, all these historical and, um, comments are then stored in the database and a final decision can be taken. That's uh, further down to the left. And then finally, um, this tool also helps to actually create a repo, um, which uh, compiles all the different information um, with metrics as well as user comments uh, to create that documented evidence that we need in regulatory uh, environments. And then a last example, most recently, we have initiated a three-part presentation series um, that we have called Case Series, where eight different pharma companies have shared their experience of building that GXP framework with R. And uh, they have highlighted different aspects which were easy to implement of that framework and others which were more challenging. And it was very interesting to see that how the theoretical framework that was outlined in the uh, white paper um, just uh, a few years ago has been implemented uh, with different, I want to say, flavors. Um, so for instance, uh, different weights were, were assigned to the test testing coverage, but also the different suggested met uh, maintenance metrics 
And um, there were also different uh, risk remediation strategies that have been applied. However, there were also open issues and things for further collaboration, um, such as um, having an exchange. How do you actually ensure that the R package reviewers do have the right technical expertise, depending on which package you are reviewing and which package do you want to use? Um, so having the right target group, but also the right technical uh, expertise in both was not always uh, easy to find and um, there were different strategies. Another open topic is a little bit um, around finding appropriate test data and also sharing those test cases that may have been added in the remediation process. Um, and then another thing that is uh, more under discussion recently is actually creating a repo where we, uh, we as pharma companies um, uh, can exchange our assessment on specific packages and how we drive these things forward. So these are just some examples for um, further development. And I really want to encourage you, um, I have those uh, footnotes here a little bit hidden away, but there's an active discussion going on and exchanges to be continued as we had the last case study uh, just last week. Um, and that is to be con continued on GitHub. And uh, you're obviously very welcome to pitch in and uh, just uh, do a little bit of a sneak what others are doing and learn from others. So finally, I want to also highlight some of the partner initiatives. The R Validation Hub is not existing in a vacuum. Um, and uh, it is part of a number of cross-industry collaborations. Um, for instance, the R tables for regulatory submission working group, they have the goal as a working group uh, to create standards for creating tables that meet the requirements of FDA submissions and hence enhance the suitability of R for FDA submissions. Um, the R submission pilot working group is focused more on the IT and the platform challenges um, of all R regulatory submissions. It doesn't mean um, so. Um, and they actually were able in November 2021 uh, to execute their first submission and send it to the FDA. They had some minor issues as response that is not uncommon. And those were easily resolved. So the in February 2022, um, there was the first all uh, pilot submission has been completed. Future work will be focusing on advanced analysis methods, but also on uh, submitting shiny apps. So um, stay tuned. And um, yeah, that's uh, very interesting stuff going on there. Um, other things are, for instance, also the clinical statistical reporting on the multilingual world, which seeks to provide a framework assessing fundamental differences for particular statistical analysis across languages. Um, sometimes you end up with different results, so um, some resolutions towards that. And um, there's also our pharma that we would like to mention, which is an annual conference that focuses on the use of R in the clinical drug development. Having said that, I would like to summarize. I think the R validation have really supported the establishment of an open source mentality um, of sharing within the biopharmaceutical industry. That has not been always the case, and I think um, it's a hard nut to crack. And um, with that, we are uh, under the umbrella of the R Validation Hub. There were a bunch of tools developed for risk-based assessment to really uh, do not just um, stay in the hypotheticals, but really have practical exchange and allow others to join uh, those frameworks as well. And um, obviously, uh, helping to support with this framework, regulatory submissions with, with R um, is, a, is a good advancement um, for the short, I put that in quotes, short amount of time that we're around. If you're interested in further information, uh, pharma.arc is a good uh, place to start. There's a white paper uh, that's also on the website and uh, a Git repo. In that Git repo, um, you find links to the assessment app, to the risk metric, uh, also to the case studies. And uh, I want to thank you for your attention, but also I want to thank everyone 
who has at some point or currently or recently or uh, plans to um, contribute to the R, has contributed to the R validation hub and its partner initiatives. And if you um, feel interested and want to get involved, do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Julian. Um, we have one question. Is the assessment on the packages publicly available? It will be useful for others, users too. Yes. Um, <coughs> so yes, the, uh, that's a very valid question, a very good question. And that's one of the open things that we have uh, certainly identified and that we are looking into right now, how we can manage. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, and um, yeah, so that's one of the things that we are looking into. And um, if that particular person is interested in working on that, please uh, do not hesitate to get in touch on that. Because I agree that it, this is really fundamental, important to, to see. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, we are all on the same page and implementing this. And we have different flavors. But, um, you know, as we say, there are many ways to roam. And uh, by the end of the day, we should come up with, with a similar assessment of uh, what packages do we think um, do qualify for uh, regulatory submission work. And that's obviously also dependent on what kind of work I'm working on. If I'm doing some sort of exploratory analysis. That should be a very different thing than if I uh, do the main primary effic efficacy analysis, whether a drug is beneficial or not. Right. So there should be like very different standards and uh, we should come to a a common, it's, it's very similar agreement on that, I would say. Okay, uh, thank you so much. And um, I don't see any question on the chat or on the Q&A tab. Um, yeah, I, I have nothing else to add, but to, uh, to really be, to appreciate all the speakers and all the participants for joining us on this particular session. It was quite amazing from here, different kind of works. And um, yeah, I, I think we can come to an end, uh, not unless any other speaker wants to share the last few words. Thanks a lot for organizing us and for sharing this session. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I don't see any question popping up on the chat or on the Q and A. Um, I think I'll go ahead and stop the broadcast. So thanks again to all our speakers and all our participants. It was quite an amazing, yeah, talk talks. Yes, <laughs> and uh, I look forward to interacting with you. And uh, at least some of the participants have shown interest in, for example, um, Julian's uh, work. So yeah, they'll be reaching out, hopefully. <laughs> okay, uh, bye and enjoy your day, evening, uh, morning, wherever part of the world you're joining us from. Okay, Thanks bye. Too. Bye.